I'm weathering an Atlas Dash 8 toaster locomotive on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and if you'd like to see more model railroad tips, tools, and techniques, then be sure and subscribe down below and click that little bell icon so you can catch future videos. Several years back, I purchased an Atlas N-Scale Dash 840B locomotive that I use for classification and also for local service out of North Yard on my layout. Well, I've had plans for several years to weather this locomotive, and in recent years, I had decided that when I did, I want to make this a toaster locomotive. Dash 8s are known for their turbo and engine fires, and for having long hoods that are burned out as a result of those fires, and I thought it would be fun to weather this particular model to simulate that effect. Now, I have weathered tons of rolling stock over the years, but I haven't weathered as many locomotives, and this kind of a burned out locomotive is a completely new process for me, so I'm going to be learning as I go, and I'm going to show you exactly how it comes out as I do it. So, let's head on over to the workbench, and I'll show you exactly how I weathered this locomotive from start to finish. Be sure and check out Midwest Model Railroad. With some of the best prices and customer service in the business, they're your one-stop model railroad shop. MidwestModelRR.com. Link in the description. BNSF number 8615 is a patched out former Santa Fe Dash 840B locomotive produced by Atlas. I've had this model for several years, and it operates in classification and local service out of North Yard on my layout. For this project, I want to produce a heavily weathered locomotive, and one that's had an engine fire as is common on these Dash 8 units. For inspiration, I'm using some prototype photos of BNSF number 8625 that I found on the internet, but I'm not trying to reproduce this weathering job exactly, just using it for a reference photo. I began by dismantling the locomotive. I removed the body shell, the truck side frames, and the fuel tank. For projects like this, I like to use a shallow box to keep all the parts together and oriented correctly. Next, I dismantled the body shell by removing the walkway from the main body, removing the cab from the main body, removing the front and rear headlights and number boards, removing all of the handrails from the walkways, and removing the window glass from the cab. Right off, I managed to break the sunshades off the cab and thought that I had lost one, so I ordered a new set from Atlas's parts department online. I also removed the couplers from the walkways. These are Microtrain's couplers that I installed myself after the fact. My first step in weathering is to apply a fade coat to the paint. I used a paper towel roll as a paint handle for the walkways and the body shell. I used painter's tape applied sticky side out on a paint stirring stick as a paint handle for the fuel tank, cab, and handrails. For the fade coat, I used Model Master's Flat White mixed in a wash of about 10% paint and 90% isopropyl alcohol sprayed through my airbrush. I didn't film a lot of the painting steps for this video as it just becomes very repetitive watching someone spray paint. Here are the parts with the fade coat applied. The key to a good fade coat is to apply light coats, let them dry, and assess the amount of fade you have. It's very easy to get carried away and fade things too much, so light coats are the answer. Also, good lighting is key to knowing how the fade coat really looks, so be sure your spray booth is well lit similarly to your layout. Next, I turn to the truck side frames. I like to use clothespins turned backwards in their springs as clamps, and in this case, as paint handles. I didn't film it, but I started by applying a coat of dull coat to the side frames. This gives some tooth for the weathering to stick to the slick plastic of the side frames. I used two different methods for weathering the trucks. On the first side, I used artist oils, specifically burnt umber and raw sienna. I applied the paint with the narrow end of a makeup wedge torn to make a rough surface. I dampened the sponge with turpenoid, then squeezed and blotted it until the sponge was barely damp. Some people also like to use mineral spirits or white spirits for this, 
but I find the terpenoid works really well and is really low odor. I started with the lighter color and applied it generally to the truck. I let it dry for a few minutes before working the paint. I used the barely damp sponge to blot the paint off until it resembled the general rust spots that I was looking for. I used a small brush to drag some of the rust down to create rust streaks. Don't let this video fool you. I worked the trucks over several times before I got the effect that I really liked. The nice thing about artist oils is that even if they dry, you can reactivate them with the solvent and rework them simply by applying some more solvent to the paint. I let the raw sienna dry for a day, and then I came back with a small paintbrush and the burnt umber paint and applied some of the older, darker rust. Just like with the sponge, I dampened the brush in terpenoid and blotted off on a paper towel to leave it just barely damp. Again, I applied and removed paint several times until I got the effect that I was after. When the oils had dried, I used some oily black paint to apply some grease to the hub bearings, the cylinders, and the areas around them. For the other side of the trucks, I used gouaches, artists' watercolors, in burnt umber, burnt sienna, and yellow ochre. Because I didn't have the raw sienna color that I wanted, I mixed these colors to approximate the color that I was looking for. In this case, I used water instead of terpenoid for a solvent. If you're used to working with artist oils, the gouaches take some getting used to as they work just a little bit differently. One thing that will help you achieve the effect that you want is to periodically take a photo with your phone. Zoom in on the photo on your phone where you can see exactly the effect that you're creating. After the trucks were done, I turned to the fuel tank. I again used artist oils for this process. I used burnt umber to apply rust and grime first to the air tanks on the ends and I let it dry. I then used a bit of raw sienna to add a bit of newer rust to the hardware on the air tanks. I also used the raw sienna to apply some general rust and grime to the sides of the fuel tanks themselves using a brush damp with terpenoid to drag this paint down to thin it and to add streaks down the sides of the tank. I used a bit of caboose red paint to paint the filler caps and some oily black paint to paint streaks from fuel spills down the sides below the filler cap, as well as to paint the hoses on the ends of the air tanks. For this kind of detail work in end scale, you need some very fine brushes. In this case, and in many cases, I used an 18 aught spotter brush. When it came to simulating the burned portions of the long hood, I had seen this effect created many times but had never done it myself, so I used some scraps of styrene to practice the technique with both gouaches and artist oils in varying colors to see what would work the best. I ended up using a combination of the two techniques. I first mixed a primer gray color with the gouaches and applied it to the edges of the burned areas to simulate primer where the paint had been burned away. I let that dry and then mixed a variety of artist oils to simulate the actual burned paint and metal. This is a good time to mention that, in some ways, weathering an end scale is a real challenge, more so than in larger scales. This is due in part to the fact that the paint itself has texture which is hard to scale down. Artist oils especially can leave a rough texture if not worked carefully, and that rough texture can be overblown in end scale, so great care must be taken to get the color and the texture just right. When applying these artist oils, it's challenging to get enough paint on the model to cover the paint underneath without having a texture problem. This is where I realized later I might have been better to go ahead and paint the entire area with a gray gouache so I wouldn't have had the issues with the paint showing through. I used multiple coats as the answer, applying a bit of paint, allowing it to dry for a day, then applying another coat. 
This layered technique helps you to achieve the layers of colors that you want on this burned look as well. I applied the lighter color of rust first, adding the darker color later and leaving the lighter color around the edges. I also wrapped the burnt effect up onto the top panels of the hood as well. I repeated this process on the other side of the locomotive, giving the burned area a different shape similar to my reference photos. Covering the S on the second side proved an even more challenge than on the first, but multiple coats did the trick. I applied rust to the sills of the locomotive, especially under the battery box hinges, and used a damp brush to drag down some rust streaks from there. I also added some rust streaks specifically under the areas where the burned hood will be. For variety, I faded one of the small doors more than the others to simulate a door cover that may have been replaced. Turning to the cab, I applied rust to the roof along the angle lines where the paint often chips. For this very fine painting job, I used a piece of brass wire stuck in a scrap of balsa wood for a handle. I used a scrap of the makeup sponge, dampened in turbidoid, and held between some tweezers to soften and manipulate the paint. I applied this rust in two stages as I had done before, the light color first and then the dark. I also applied a bit of rust to one side of the cab. I used a small sponge and some residue paint to apply some general grime to the cab as well. I applied dark rust to the snowplow and rear pilot, as well as some general grime to the other parts of the sill, battery boxes, and low hood. I added a bit more dark rust to the lower part of the long hood access doors, the inside edges of the walkways, and generally to the walkways where the burned hood was. Next, it was time to work on the handrails. I painted the stair rails safety white using Model Master's flat white. I then applied some grime and rust using artist oils, the light color first and then the dark. I added extra rust near the areas where the fire had been. I applied this rust and grime unevenly over all of the handrails and the stanchions. I paid special attention to rusting the safety chains on the porch rails. These always seem to be very rusty. I painted my new sunshades, Fort Worth and Western Yellow, from some true color paint that I had on hand. This is not a true match for the Santa Fe yellow, but the sunshades on my reference photo did not match either, and I planned to weather them to a darker color. I used a black panel liner from AK Interactive to darken the various grills and grates along the sides and the top of the long hood. This process is easy and a lot of fun, as capillary action pulls the paint right into the lines and really makes the grates pop. The brake wheel in some of the reference photos showed that most of the paint was off of the brake wheel, and in others it showed what appeared to be a new brake wheel in all primer, so I painted the brake wheel a primer gray. I sealed my work so far with an acrylic gloss coat with an airbrush. When that had dried, I used Ammo by MIG's Starship Wash to add general grime and streaks to the body. This is an enamel wash, so the acrylic gloss coat protects the artist oils from being disturbed by the solvent in the wash and provides a smooth surface that allows the wash to be pulled into the detail lines and not grabbed too much onto the sides of the locomotive. I applied the wash in a liberal coat, then used a damp brush with turpenoid to streak it straight down the body and remove the paint until I was happy with the application. Note that I clean my brush and turpenoid often and dab it off on the paper towel. This keeps me from reapplying the paint that I've just removed and has left on the brush to other parts of the body. You want to concentrate your shrinking to the flat panels, allowing the wash to rest in the nooks and crannies to enhance the details. You can always apply a second coat of this product as a pin wash in the details if you need to. This step really makes the doors and other panel details stand out. 
I treated the roof and the ends of the body, the sills, the pilots, and the cab in the same way. I especially like the effect that it gives to the cab door and window details. To add exhaust streaks to the roof, I used Monroe Models Weathering Powders Grimy Black. Personally, I think the weathering powders create the feathered look of the exhaust streaks better than an airbrush. I apply a small amount of the powder at a time and scrub it in with a stiff brush to cause it to adhere. To apply the new sunshades, I needed to remove the broken mounting pins from the old ones. I prepared to drill these out, but it turned out that they simply pushed through the holes with the drill bit. I applied the new sunshades, cementing them in place with a drop of solvent cement applied from the inside of the cab. I weathered the sunshades with a fading wash, and then when that was dry, I gave it an application of the streaking wash that I had used on the rest of the locomotive. I very carefully painted the couplers with Model Master's leather colored paint. I was careful not to get the paint into the moving parts of the coupler or into the draft gear box so it does not interfere with the operation of the couplers. I painted the trip pins oily black. The pins require two coats to fully cover the metal. With the weathering done, I gave everything a coat of dull coat with an airbrush to seal it in. Finally, when that was dry, it was time to reassemble the locomotive, starting with the body shell and the walkways, then the windows, headlights and number boards, the cab, the handrails. The side handrails are easy to install. The front and rear ones can be a real challenge, but with a little patience, I got them into place. I reinstalled the truck side frames, and then replaced the shell on the chassis, and finally, I reinstalled the couplers and checked to make sure the coupler height was correct. I replaced the fuel tank and my locomotive was complete. Now it's time to take it back over to North Yard and give it a test run. Well, I think this weathering job on this locomotive are going to fit in perfectly for the purpose that it serves on my layout in local and switching service. And I'm really glad that I tried this particular process. It was a lot of fun, and I'm really happy with the way it came out. Well, if you'd like to see more videos about weathering locomotives and rolling stock, check out the playlist in the corner of your screen right now. I hope you'll take a moment to check out the description as well, where you're going to find a link to my Amazon page and my Amazon pick of the week, as well as many other great links that you will enjoy and benefit from. Be sure and check those out. Well, if you'd like more Model Railroad content right now, check out the links on your screen. And be sure and join me each Tuesday as I bring you even more great Model Railroad videos. And I look forward to seeing you then. Tim, Lizzie?